This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, copper overload, a commonly unrecognized cause of depression and anxiety. I felt like a zombie. For eight years, I stayed on antidepressants, hoping that one of them would help. And unfortunately, none of them did. Too much copper and its estrogen connection when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. This week on Viewpoints. There's an old saying in Nepal that educating your daughter is like watering a flower in another man's garden. What's being done to stop human trafficking in Nepal? Then... The first barrier to get over with our customers is that freshness perception. Farmer's Bridge is changing the vending machine game. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Deb Tokars of Cary, Illinois, said she was a happy and optimistic child and teenager. Now she's 60 and she still seems happy today. But she says the decades in between were anything but. She says starting in her early 20s, her life was a hell of misdiagnosed mental illness, debilitating anxiety, agitation, and depression. She couldn't explain why in just a few months she went from happy and normal to a suicide attempt. I had recently gotten married, had a lot of things happening in my life with getting married, getting an apartment and changes in my life. And then I had started birth control pills. And it was after I had started the birth control pills that I went into the sudden despair. And that's where the attempted suicide happened. I didn't know what hit me. I had no reason to be depressed or to feel those symptoms at at all. So it happened after the birth control pills, but because I had so many changes in my life, I didn't connect it with the birth control pills. Deb didn't connect her illness with birth control pills back then, nor with the prenatal vitamins she took when she got pregnant, nor with the hormone replacement therapy she took many years later. Each dose of estrogen increased her mental fog and agitation, and with her second pregnancy, she fell off the cliff. I, at times, felt like I was going crazy. I went into a depression and anxiety and didn't, I don't know how to explain it other than than I was fearful. I was very fearful for my unborn child and for myself with that pregnancy. And I opted at that time to terminate the pregnancy. So I didn't feel like being a mother again was something that I could handle. Tokar spiraled into PTSD. She was immobilized by guilt, shame, and depression. She gave in and finally started taking the antidepressants that she'd refused before. The antidepressants actually worsened my anxiety, gave me side effects of restless leg syndrome. I gained weight on them. I felt like a zombie. For eight years, I stayed on antidepressants, hoping that one of them would help. And unfortunately, none of them did. No antidepressant would ever work because her symptoms were the result of an undiagnosed overload of copper in her bloodstream. Deb's memoir of her decades-long struggle and how she climbed out of it is called I See You Copper, after the symbol for copper, see you on the periodic table of elements. As soon as they tested me, they said, I have high copper, estrogen dominant, and that the estrogen actually retains copper in the body. And so the birth control pill, the prenatal vitamin, the hormone replacement drugs all contain estrogen. That was causing copper to retain in my body. What they told me is 35% of women test as estrogen dominant. And that's just the women who get tested. So it is common. The problem is traditional doctors don't test for it. So that's why it's a little known condition. Well, it's a condition that has become increasingly common because of the widespread use of oral contraceptives that contain estrogen. And estrogen increases the absorption of copper in the body. That's Dr. Judy Safrier, a holistic psychiatrist in Boston and teaching associate in psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. In addition 
there are so many what are called xenoestrogens, chemical compounds that mimic estrogen that are found in plastics and petrochemicals that we're exposed to, as well as growth hormones that are fed to animals and copper fungicides. So all of that increases our copper load. Estrogen attracts copper. Shellfish and chocolate are high in copper, too. For most people, that doesn't matter, since they're able to get rid of extra copper in the body. But some people can't, due to a specific malfunctioning protein. There's a protein in the body which is actually one of the main antioxidants called metallothionine. We don't hear about it much, but it's a big player when it comes to regulating trace metals like copper and zinc. And it's also important in removing other toxins, including metals, from the body. Dr. Courtney Snyder is a physician and holistic psychiatrist in Louisville, Kentucky. She has a strong interest in nutrition and its effect on the brain. So if it's not working up to speed, and that could be for genetic reasons, then someone could be more prone to develop copper overload. Or if it's overwhelmed by another form of toxicity, then it may not be doing its job with zinc and copper. And one of the things that helps it function better is zinc. So if someone's low in zinc, then it may not be working up to speed, which is why one of the things that we use to bring down copper when it's elevated is zinc. Snyder and Safrir say severe psychological symptoms, like what Deb had, are not uncommon for someone who's suffering from copper toxicity. Inattention or ADHD-like symptoms, high anxiety, even anger and rage for some people. It probably explains or is related to about 17% of depression, and specific to it is this volatility. When a person presents with a lot of anxiety or panic or agitation, they're restless if they have insomnia, racing thoughts. It can have like an amphetamine-like effect on the nervous system, and so when I see a person who is revved up in that way, that's one of the conditions that I would consider. In addition, because of its relationship to estrogen and hormones, anybody who presents with a history of severe premenstrual syndrome or who has a postpartum depression or who became depressed after starting to take the birth control pill or they get a copper IUD put in, and then they start having a lot of symptoms. Those are patients that I would think about as being potentially toxic with copper. Knowing that has changed how Snyder and Safrir practice. They test copper levels on most of their patients because an imbalance is so common, particularly among women because of the importance of estrogen, but among anyone when red flags start going up. There's a whole history that's very common with people who have copper overload, such as like a history of hyperactivity or actually academic underachievement, learning disabilities, attentional problems, white spots on the fingernails, skin intolerance to cheap metals, ringing in the ears, food sensitivities to dye and shellfish, poor immune function sleep problems, poor concentration and focus, all of these, when you take a very detailed history and when you start hearing that a person is endorsing all of these different kinds of symptoms, then your index of suspicion rises. Treating copper toxicity isn't difficult. Zinc, B vitamins, and a mineral called molybdenum are all part of the nutritionals that can bind with copper and pull the excess out of the body. Deb Tokars found out it can be slow going. I'll tell you that it took four years for my labs to come back normal, but during that four years, I was feeling better. Each month, each year, I was feeling better. Unlike the antidepressants where I kept feeling worse, on the nutrient therapy, I kept feeling better each year until when I finally got the results back that everything was normalized. I wasn't surprised because I was feeling wonderful. My symptoms were pretty much non-existent. Yet for decades, with doctor after doctor, Deb never got the right diagnosis, let alone treatment. Safrir says most physicians don't even think about heavy metal toxicity and mental health. She says it suffers the catch-22 of being treatable without medication. When there's not pharmaceutical companies involved, then there's no money to create double-blind, placebo-controlled studies, which is like the standard of 
evidence that's required. And you have to have enormous amounts of money in order to create those kinds of studies and research. And so it doesn't get done, and then it's said to be not valid because there's not those studies. There's also not much in the way of studies about the effects of another toxin in the body, mold. It's a very common, underrecognized cause of psychiatric illness. We're finding mold toxicity to be very common, much more than was ever realized, and now we're able to measure for mold toxins. And we do find that because it's so common that it does seem to intersect with copper overload and the thinking being that if someone has mold toxicity, that metallocyanine antioxidant is, as I mentioned earlier, overwhelmed by the mold toxins such that it's not doing this job around copper and zinc regulation. Mold toxicity isn't the same thing as mold allergy. It's much worse, but Snyder says it can have many of the same symptoms as copper overload. Mold toxicity can cause ADHD-like symptoms. It can cause depression, high anxiety. It can cause temper and rage episodes in people, even without there being copper overload. So they can look similar, but with mold toxicity, more specific symptoms would be neurologic type symptoms. Not that everyone has to have those, but those would be more red flags. And those would be like low grade numbness in the toes or fingers, you know, some nonspecific dizziness, shooting sort of spark kind of pains in the body. That we wouldn't expect with copper overload, but that could be an indicator of mold. When a person has mold toxicity, they're really quite ill. And I mean, increasingly, people come to me because they're not just anxious and depressed, but they have issues with their digestion, they have skin issues, they have joint pain, they have chronic fatigue. All of these conditions can be very much linked to mold toxicity. Safrir says treating mold toxicity relies on the same principles as treating copper overload, but utilizing different nutritionals. First, binders to get the, another word for binders is sequestrants. So substances that help the mold get out of the body, such as charcoal or clay, and there's other ones such as chlorella, or there's a pharmaceutical that's called cholestyramine that is also very good for binding mold. So the first step is to bind the mold toxins. And then there can be prescription antifungals used, both nasal and oral. There's also herbal antifungals that can be used. But it's a very slow process, and it has to be done very cautiously and carefully because if it's done too aggressively, you make a person feel much more ill, and it's counterproductive. You're making their condition worse because it's possible when you're trying to bind the mold that you overwhelm the system's capacity to detox. Safrir says if mold invades a home after a flood, for example, not everyone who lives there may be affected. Again, in that way, it's like copper toxicity, only for those who can't detoxify mold in their systems. And like copper overload, mold toxicity is a foreign concept to a lot of doctors. Deb Tokars was misdiagnosed. She knows she spent decades suffering as a result. But she's using her experience to try to help others avoid the same fate. Just coming out of the darkness and being where I am today, I feel liberated being able to say I survived this and I can talk about this. So I put that anger aside of regret and I'm just thankful that I'm alive. You can find a resource of physicians who are trained in treating copper toxicity through the Walsh Research Institute at walshinstitute.org. Information about the book I See You Copper is at debtokars.com. Or you can find out more about all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call this toll-free number right now. 800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. By calling your addiction team, you're taking the first steps to recovery. Don't fight addiction alone. Their advisors are ready to take your call. Your future is still a bright place. The help you need could be one call away. 
800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. This call is completely confidential. And if you have private insurance, there could be little to no cost to you. Even if you've already been to treatment, give us a call. There is no need to let addiction ruin your life. Take the first step now. Call your addiction team at 800-279-0419. That's 800-279-0419. Make the free call now. 800-279-0419. Your addiction team is a third-party advertiser for various treatment centers and placement networks. Individual results will vary. Visit youraddictionteam.com slash terms for more information. Paid non-attorney spokesperson paid for by the Sentinel Group. Attention military vets and current soldiers who served between 2002 to 2016. Have you or a loved one suffered hearing loss or tinnitus after serving or while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces? You may be entitled to compensation. 3M, the manufacturer of earplugs made for combat, recently paid the government $9.1 million to settle a False Claims Act case for knowingly selling these defective earplugs for over a decade. Specifically, the United States argued that the manufacturer knew their earplugs were too short for proper insertion into users' ears and that the earplugs could loosen and therefore didn't perform properly or reduce noise the way they should have. If you or a loved one suffered hearing loss or tinnitus after serving or while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, you need to choose the right legal team that has the experience, support staff, and resources to seek the most compensation for your injuries. Call the Sentinel Group now for more information and a free case review. Call 800-655-6458. 800-655-6458. That's 800-655-6458. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it, you could junk it, or you can donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-835-1478. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you, you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to over 50 locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now. Call 1-800-835-1478. Donating is easy, and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher for donating. Call now, 1-800-835-1478. That's 1-800-835-1478. Thank you for listening to Radio Health Journal, a production of MediaTrax Communications. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please support our show by subscribing, sharing it with a friend, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find more Radio Health Journal stories about health, science, and technology on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and RadioHealthJournal.net. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. We all too often see people looking at the date and throwing out food unnecessarily. When they do that, they're not only throwing out the food, but they're throwing money right down the trash. Food waste. It costs more than most people think. Then hypothalamic hematoma. Since laughter is the main symptom, or at least the first one, a delay in diagnosis is nothing unusual. We always thought that it was a sign for him to tell us somehow, his body somehow was telling us that it's time for him to go to sleep. He would also giggle in the middle of the night. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.